title of my sermon tonight is Two Problems with the Modern Versions of the Bible. Two Problems with the Modern Versions. Now, we are clean at our church, and there's a reason why we're King James only. It's not just because we feel sentimental about the English of 400 years ago. There are major, major problems in the modern versions, and they affect doctrine. And they are part of a plan of the devil to destroy people's faith in the Word of God and to lead people into false doctrine. I'm going to prove that to you tonight, and I'm going to show you the two major problems because there are two separate issues at work here. Whenever we compare the King James Bible to one of these modern versions of the Bible, there are two reasons why that modern version would be wrong, and they're separate reasons, okay? Reason number one is that many times the Greek text that's being used is the wrong Greek text. So you'll get a totally different reading. So it's not that it's a difference in translation. It's that you're translating two different sources. Yeah. You're translating two different books, right? But then the second problem is just the bad translation techniques of the modern versions, just plain bad scholarship, just plain being bad at your job. Just people who are bad at their job and are not smart and are not good at translating and are not fluent in the languages involved. You see, today's so-called Greek scholars are not even fluent in Greek. You don't learn a language just from listening and reading. You have to speak a language in order to become fluent in it. That is the way our brains are wired to work. We learn languages by speaking. That's why the best methods for learning foreign languages involve you speaking in those languages and talking because that's how our brains work. The men who translated the King James Bible, they understood that. They spoke many languages fluently. And in fact, when they got together and just chatted with each other, they would speak in Latin, which was a dead language, but they spoke it. And today they say, oh, well, we can't speak Greek. It's a dead language, so nobody's fluent in it. We just look at our lexicons and look at our tools and our apparatus and all this. But here's the thing. There's this country called Greece, believe it or not, where people speak Greek. In fact, there's 14, 15 million of them over there that speak Greek. You can actually go there and speak Greek. Now, these scholars have perpetrated the greatest fraud in the history of academia with their fake pronunciation, this Erasmian pronunciation, where they've come up with a reconstruction of what Greek sounded like 2,000 years ago. Now, I don't know what tape recordings they're basing this on, since none of that equipment existed 2,000 years ago, but they say, well, this is how it was pronounced 2,000 years ago. So what they do is they pronounce it with this made-up fake pronunciation, and then when you try to tell them to go to Greece and talk to Greek people, here's what they say. Oh, that's a totally different language. Yeah, because you're pronouncing it wrong. But actually, if they would pronounce it right like Greek people pronounce it, you say, how do you know it's right? Well, there's 15 million people over in Greece that agree with me. And anytime I upload a video about Greek, they're always piping up saying, you're right, you're right on. And finally, a, an American white person gets it, you know, of course, they're white too, but, you know, of course, finally, a, an American is saying the truth because, you know, the, the, this fraud of speaking in this weird pronunciation, and I'll tell you why, there's one reason why they've come up with this warped pronunciation of the Greek. It's so that they can't talk to Greek people, and then they can pretend that they know a language that they don't speak. It's that simple. See, people come in here and they start telling me what the Hebrew says, and I say to them, Ata me and they're like, huh? And they can't even speak a simple sentence of Hebrew, but they're going to tell you all about the Hebrew. Well, these so called Greek scholars are often the same way. You could walk up to them and say, you know, something in, in Greek, and they have no idea what you're saying because they don't actually speak the language. So then they hide behind, oh, you're pronouncing it different. But it doesn't matter how you pronounce it, they don't know the language. It's a lack of scholarship. It's a lack of due diligence in learning Greek and learning Hebrew. The men who sit on these translation committees, they're not experts to the level of what the King James translators were. And often they're wicked men. They have an agenda. The love of money is involved in selling new Bibles. 
So there are two problems here. Number one, the problem is when they're translating from the wrong Greek text. And then number two, the problem is when they don't know the language, they're using bad translation techniques. They're not good at what they do. And even the world will look at the King James Bible and say that it's great translation, great scholarship, great literature, beautiful, amazing. These new versions sound like junk. Even just from an artistic standpoint, even just from a literary standpoint. And listen, I've worked as a professional translator. My wife has worked as a professional translator. And if we turned in the kind of garbage that the NIV's translators have done, we would be fired. I'm not kidding. Any translator would be fired if they turned in this kind of junk. My wife's nodding her head. And I'm going to show you some of the, the ridiculous translation. I mean, he, you know, he has showed thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord doth require of thee. The NIV, he showed you, O human one. That's not a good translation. That's a bad translation. If I turned that in to a translation agency, they'd tell me to go find another job. O human one. It's, I mean, much of the NIV literally sounds like it's been thrown into Google Translate. And they just took whatever came out and just that's what they went with. That's their final draft. It sounds that bad. Now, I'm going to show you some specific examples here. And you don't, you're not even going to have to know any Greek tonight to be able to understand what I'm showing you. I'm going to prove that it's a bad translation without using any Greek. Even I'll show you from English. I'll prove it to you that it's a bad translation. But I need some helpers up here tonight to uh, hold the, the modern false Bibles. Jonathan Shelley, you want to move up to the front row right here? Is Brother Garrett Kirschway available? You tied up? You want to come sit in the front row here? And I'm going to issue these guys some of the false Bibles so that they can look these things up. Okay, so I'm going to give you the new King James Version. I'm going to give you the ESV. Okay, and then I need some other... Brother Jarrett, you want to help me out? You want to be the NIV guy? This is the 1984 NIV because they're always changing it. So stay in the front row. And then uh, who, wants to, who wants to help me out with the New World Translation? The, you want to come sit in the front row with this thing? All right, here you go. And then what else we got? We got all kinds of stuff in here. Let's see. New American Standard. That's the one that the really smart theologians and scholars. All right, you're worthy of the scholarship here. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm going to show you these, these changes in these versions, they really affect doctrine. You will not, you will not be doctrinally sound if you're on one of these versions. You will not show me a church that has all their doctrine right unless they're King James. These, these versions will lead you into false doctrine because the changes are dramatic, they're strategic, And they regard salvation and other key doctrines. Now, this is a major one right here. And this is one where the Greek text says the same thing in both cases. So this isn't a matter of different Greek texts. This is a matter of bad translation. Okay, look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. And the Bible reads, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now, that's a great verse, isn't it? The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Okay, let's see what the New King James says. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the big colossal difference there is that in the King James, we're saved. Yeah. But in the new King James, we're being saved. Okay, what do you got there in the ESV? For you, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. All right, what you got over here in the uh, New American Standard? For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. How about the new living? For the speech... About or new the world, rather. State is <laughs> foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is God's power. Of course, the Jehovah's Witness Bible also takes out the cross and turns it into a stake. But they said the same thing, being saved. Now you say, well, Pastor Anderson, 
all these scholars agree. The NIV, the New King James, the, the ESV, the New World, you know, everybody agrees. How do you know that you're right? In fact, I even talked to a guy who was a King James guy, but he went to one of these seminaries where they taught him all this Greek and everything, and he said, well, you know, if you go back to the original Greek, it really does say being saved. That's what he told me. He's even a King James only guy. And I'm just, what? What are you talking about? Now, I'm going to prove to you beyond any shadow of a doubt that these modern so-called scholars are totally wrong and that the King James gets it right. And by the way, let me say this. All old Bibles all said saved here. All the old versions, not just the King James. All the old Bibles. And if you go to foreign languages, old Spanish Bibles, old German Bibles, they all said they're saved. This is only new versions. Because we've gotten so much smarter now and we understand the, 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 the scholarship of the Greek and the, you know. Okay, but keep your finger in 118 there. And go to Revelation 21, 24. And look, if these guys are translating the Bible and they have these committees and they're so smart and they've done so much study, how could they make such a foolish error? And it's a wicked error because it destroys the doctrine of salvation. Look, we're not being saved. Salvation is not a process. We're already saved. Amen. That makes it sound like it's a works-based salvation where it's a process and you're being saved. Now look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 24. The Bible says, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. This is talking about that heavenly Jerusalem that descends down from heaven, right? after the millennium, because the millennium takes place in chapter 20. Chapters 21 and 22, we're talking new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem comes down, and the nations of them which are saved walk in the light of new Jerusalem. Now, here's the thing. If I open my Greek New Testament, the exact same word for them which are saved in 1 Corinthians 1.18 is the exact same Greek word as those which are saved in Revelation 21, 24. So let me ask you this. Are these people in Revelation 21, 24 being saved? After the millennium? I mean, think about it. Everything's over. The resurrection's over. The tribulation's over. The millennium's over. We're in a new heaven, new earth, no more death. No more sorrow, no more crying. Former things are passed away. There's no night there. There's no seas. No, the former things are gone. Are you going to tell me that those people are being saved? Isn't that ridiculous? But guess what? It's the same word. So who knows Greek now? See, even people who speak Spanish understand that there's a difference between the preterite and the imperfect past tense. One of them is the so-called ongoing, and the other is more of a finite moment in time. But these modern scholars, they don't understand how that works. Spanish speakers understand how that works because they're using it every day in speech, not just sitting in some office somewhere. Now, if we look at this verb tense, it's actually a continual ongoing. But they've never heard it in use. They've never actually used it. They've just got it all in theory from books, and that's not how you learn a language. You learn a language by actually speaking it. And so this should put it to bed right here. How can anyone in their right mind look at this and say, oh, being saved is correct in light of what you see there in Revelation 21? You say, well, what do the modern versions put in Revelation 21? Isn't that kind of the question that's on your mind? Are they going to put being saved for that same Greek word? Okay, read us Revelation 21, 24 in your, in your uh, New King James Version. And the nations of those who are saved. Oh, whoops. Now all of a sudden that, that same Greek word gets translated as saved in the New King James, conveniently. Okay, let's hear it from the ESV. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. No mention of even being saved. 
Did you hear that? Read it again. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Let's get it from the Jehovah's Witness Bible. And the nations will walk by means of its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Yeah, no mention of even being saved. And the nations shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. No mention of saved. The only one that mentions anything about the saved is the New King James, because here's the thing. The New King James is translating from the same Greek text as the King James is. These other ones have a different Greek text that omits the word saved there conveniently because it would expose what they're doing over in 1 Corinthians 1.18 where they're changing saved to being saved. And look, I don't care how many degrees you have after your name. That Greek word does not mean being saved is a, as a continual process because that would make zero sense in Revelation 21.24. Even just a layman can see that. And so they're wrong. They're just flat out wrong. It's not an opinion. They're wrong. And that's why every Bible in the 1500s and 1600s and 1700s all got it right until you get into the modern perversions of Scripture. Of course, the devil wants to tax salvation and make it a process. Look, born again isn't a process. Being born the first time wasn't a process. I was born on July 24th, 1981 at 4.11 p.m. I wasn't born over the course of many months or years. Now, that's a pretty key doctrine, isn't it? Go to Matthew chapter 7. And, and by the way, let's just, even, even without even looking at Revelation 21, 24, where you have the same word, okay? Even just within the verse itself, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, If you're going to say being saved, then you have to say those who are perishing. Because the King James said there's those who perish and there's those who are saved, right? Well, in order to make salvation a process, then you have to make death a process. Think about that. So they say those who are perishing and those who are being saved. Now, let me ask this. Are unsaved people in the process of perishing right now? I mean, what kind of nonsense is that? Like, I'm dying. I'm dying. How long have you been dying? All my life. I've been dying. It's, it, it, that's what I'm saying. These people would be fired from a translating job. Death is not some drawn-out process that takes your whole life. It happens in a moment. And salvation happens in a moment as well. In the Bible, they gave up the ghost. That's death. It happens in a moment. And then it's over. Look, if you would, at Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. This is a pretty important verse about salvation. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Now, notice the spelling of the word straight there. S-T-R-A-I-T, which is like the straits of Gibraltar. It's a very narrow passage or a narrow way. Straight is the gate. We're not talking about not being crooked. That would be a G-H-T situation, right? So it's, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So the whole point that Jesus Christ is making here is about how many people are going to be saved. He's saying the broad way leads to destruction. Many people are going there. Few people are finding the narrow way, the straight gate, right? Okay, let's hear this from the New King James. 13 and 14. Yep, 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So you see that little change there in verse 14. They're getting it right, getting it right, getting it right, and then all of a sudden they say, Difficult is the way that leads to life, and few there be the find. So now being saved is difficult. Well, you know what? If you believe that salvation is by faith alone, how is that difficult? That's easy. Amen. Difficult would be working your way to heaven. Yeah. That being saved, that process of salvation. And so that's a pretty colossal difference, right? ESV? Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those Did you hear that? The way is easy that leads to destruction. Did you hear that? 
Okay, keep going, sorry. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. You see that? Oh, the easy way is the one that leads you to destruction. It's the hard way that gets you saved. And you know what people say when you go out and preach that salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? They'll say, you're preaching easy believism. Isn't that what they accuse us of? Yeah. Easy, and you know, I say amen. Yeah. It's easy. It's as easy as taking a drink of water. It's as easy as eating a piece of bread. It's as easy as walking through a door. Let me tell you how easy it is to be saved. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that uh, even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. What did they have to do to that serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness. If you go back to that story, all they had to do was look at it. If they looked at it, they would be saved. So it's easy lookism. <laughs> easy look. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Sounds easy. Believe. You know, Jesus did the hard part, living that perfect life for 33 and a half years, being tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin, weeping and hungering and thirsting and working and going about doing good, being beaten, spat upon, whipped, enduring such contradiction of sinners against himself, being nailed to the cross, dying on the cross, being obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, hey, rising again from the dead. Okay, our part's pretty easy. Believe. Now, if it was keep the commandments, that'd be hard. If it was repent of all your sins, yeah, that's hard. If it was take up the cross daily and follow him, that's hard. But being saved's pretty easy. You just have to look to Jesus now and be saved. Put all your faith and trust in him, except you be converted and become his little children shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. They're saying you'll be damned if you take the easy route to salvation. How hard is it to accept a free gift? Pretty easy. Everything the Bible compares salvation to is easy. Yes, we believe in easy believism. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But this one says, no, 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 it's hard and you're being saved. Don't tell me these changes don't affect doctrine. And this is coming from the New King James too. So don't say, well, the New King James isn't that bad. Let's go to John chapter 3 next. John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. This is one that I saw going around on Facebook the last few weeks from unbelievers. Unsaved people were sharing a post using John 3.36 from the ESV saying, don't fall into the lie that you don't have to obey the commandments to be saved. Believing means you obey also. So they try to twist believing into, into including works or including obedience to the law or obedience to the commandments, right? When we all know what believe means, it's just faith and trust. It, it has nothing to do with doing works. Faith and works are two separate things. So the Bible says in John 3, 36, he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 3, 36, great salvation verse, right? Showing the difference between those who believe on the Son and those that believe not on the Son. Okay, let's hear it from the ESV. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So basically, in the ESV, there's two kinds of people. There's those who believe on Christ and those who don't obey Christ. Making it sound like if you believe on him, that means you're also obeying him. And I can't even count how many times I've had unsaved people at a door pull out their ESV and give me that verse and tell me I'm wrong on salvation. I've had the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's, it's, isn't it wrong in theirs as well? Yep. <clears throat> he that exercises faith and the Son has everlasting life. He that disobeys the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains upon him. So the, the New World translation of the Jehovah's False Witnesses takes it even further because not only do you have to obey him, but, but even the faith part, they put exercise faith. Yeah. You know, just to make it sound like a workout. 
exercise, you know. <laughs> I'm exercising my faith in you know? I'm exercising my faith in the sun. Making it sound like hard work. These are big changes. These are bad. Go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter number 10. And, and the reason I'm picking these tonight is because a lot of times we, when we talk about the false versions of the Bible, remember the title of the sermon is Two Problems with the, made, with, with the Modern Versions. We usually tend to focus on the wrong Greek text problem because it's so obvious when there's 16 entire verses missing from the New Testament, you can tell they're translating from a different source when there are 16 verses that are just gone. When whole phrases are gone, the sentences are gone, words are removed, you can tell it's just a different starting text. So we tend to focus on that. But what we need to understand is that even if you're translating from the correct Greek text, if you're following the stupidity of this modern amateur scholarship, this half, you know, baked scholarship of these new versions, you can still get the false doctrine of the being saved and doesn't obey the son. Those are based on the same Greek text as the King James. They're translating it wrong. So you got to be careful. Sometimes there will be a foreign language Bible that comes out and, oh, it's Textus Receptus based. But they're following the methods of the NIV and the ESV and the New King James. This is the kind of stuff you're going to end up with, unfortunately. Being Textus Receptus based isn't enough. You also have to do a good translation. The King James is the standard. You say, well, why is the King James the standard? Because it's the standard because it's the greatest Bible translation, best-selling, 400 years now. It's been the standard. It's the most read book in, in, in the world. And yeah, in 2017, the new versions are starting to outsell it, but it's still the most read version because yep. it sits on the shelf of the guy who goes down to the NIV Fun Center Church. He doesn't read it cover to cover like the King James only people do. But anyway, uh, are we in Mark chapter 10? Let me read it for you in the King James. Mark chapter 10, verse 23, And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? He's saying, man, it's hard for people who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered, answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? He said, look, when you're trusting in riches, it's hard to enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, with men it is impossible, but with God, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Now, to get the context here, Jesus is not saying it's hard to be saved. He's saying it's hard for rich people to be saved, specifically those who trust in riches to be saved. Now, why is that? Well, we're in Mark chapter 10. Look at the exact same chapter. I, I don't have this in my notes, but I believe a little bit earlier, verse 15, it says, Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. So it's easy for a little child to be saved. But it's only hard for people who trust in riches to be saved. It's going to be hard to get Donald Trump saved, folks. If, you, if you're on a soul winning mission to the White House, good luck with that. Because a guy like that who trusts in riches, he's very prideful. He's very full of himself. He's very arrogant because he has achieved so much that he doesn't really understand the need for accepting a free gift and leaning on someone else and saying, hey, I have nothing to offer here. I need to put all my faith and trust on Jesus. That's hard for a rich person to do because they're used to paying for everything themselves. They're not used to humbling themselves and receiving a free gift like that. They want to pay for everything themselves and earn it themselves. And they're usually very prideful people. A little child, it's very easy for them to be saved. Let's get verse 24. And you're looking down at your King James Bible. Let's get verse 24 from the ESV. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. So what's missing? In the ESV, it's just difficult to enter the kingdom of God, period. Now this is in the context of the rich young ruler. 
So this now just puts a whole different spin on that whole story that, man, it's really hard to get into heaven. I mean, you got to give up everything. Instead of just understanding that a guy who trusts in his riches is going to struggle to trust in Christ. Because he has trust in his riches, he's not used to trusting God. Somebody who's used to praying to God every day to give them their daily bread, it's going to be easier for that person to accept a free gift of salvation. What about the New King James? What do they do here in, in Mark 10, 24? And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. So the New King James gets this one right. So what does that tell us then? Is this problem number one or problem number two? If the New King James is getting it right and the modern versions besides it are getting it wrong, that means they're translated from a different Greek text is what that usually means because obviously the Greek text that they're coming from takes out the part about trusting in riches, okay? So that's why the New King James gets it right. But notice, whenever the NIV, ESV get it wrong for reason number two because of bad translating, the New King James is always right with them. Just walks right off the cliff with them every single time. Now, let me show you an example of that. Go to Acts chapter 4. And look, whenever you look at the verses that are different in the New King James, just, just try this. Look at the verses that are different in the New King James, the verses that are wrong in the New King James, and virtually every single time, whatever word they changed, the word that they chose is the exact word that the NIV uses or the exact word that the ESV uses. All the New King James is is just a hybrid of the King James and the NIV. It's just a hybrid of the King James and the ESV because any time they, they don't make their own changes. Whenever they make a change, they're just following the NIV. They're just following the ESV. They're just following these so-called modern scholars right off the cliff every time. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 27. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. So notice the holy child Jesus. Okay, let's hear it from the New King James, Acts 4.27. For truly against your holy servant Jesus. Okay, did you hear that? The, the holy servant Jesus instead of the holy child Jesus. This is the same Greek word in the original, but the New King James takes this word that's supposed to be translated as child. It's translated as child in all these other places. And it, it's a pretty simple Greek word. It's a pretty easy Greek word. What, is the, what does the ESV do with 427? For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. So holy servant Jesus in the New King James ESV. Let's go to the Jehovah's False Witnesses. Even so both Herod and Pontius Pilate with men of nations and with peoples of Israel were in actuality gathered together in this city against your holy servant Jesus whom you... That's really easy to understand, huh? That's a mouthful. Man, alive. What do you got here? The ESV or the New American Standard? What, hit us with the New American Standard. For truly in the city there were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles. Why are they all changing it? it look up all the old Bibles, the old English Bibles, old Spanish, German, whatever language you want to look up. And why are they, but now it's the servant Jesus instead of the, the, the son of God, instead of the child Jesus. Why do they all make that same change? Why do they all make the same mistakes? Why do they all, because it's not real scholarship, folks. It's just copying each other. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they'll use a really weird word in these new versions that you're scratching your head. Like instead of the King James saying quicksand, they'll say sirtis sand. And then, but then all the other versions will start doing the same thing. Seared as sand, seared as sand, seared as sand. You put seared as sand? Whoa, so did I. It's because they're not doing their own work. Yeah. They're amateurs. They're not scholars. They don't speak these languages fluently. Look up the guys who translated the King James. They didn't just know Hebrew. They also knew Arabic. You say, well, what does that matter? Because Arabic's related to Hebrew, and they learned all the languages even related to Hebrew. For the Old Testament translation, they knew Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic. They knew other languages to help them 
have a full understanding. You think that the people on the NIV Old Testament committee spoke Arabic? No. Do you believe that for five seconds? They don't even speak Hebrew. Right. They'd get lost in Israel and wouldn't even be able to find the taxi cab. <laughs> and not only did they know Greek, but they knew Latin. I mean, look, Lancelot Andrews was probably the guy who spoke the most languages on the King James Translation Committee. He spoke 21 languages fluently. Six ancient languages and 15 modern languages. And look, these guys actually spoke the ancient languages. They would get together and chit-chat in ancient languages. They could hold conversations in Greek. They could hold conversations in Latin. You'll never hear these so-called scholars and, and, you know, our resident uh, Greek scholar here in Phoenix, James White. You'll never hear James White get up and make a speech in Greek. But if you think about this, the scholarship of yesteryear, they would get up and make speeches in these foreign languages. Look, even the father of the American Revolution, Samuel Adams, in order to graduate from the sixth grade, had to get up and give a speech in Latin that he composed in Latin to graduate the sixth grade. You know, he, you know, well, you can't speak a dead language. Really? That's funny because people have done it throughout history when they actually did real scholarship, when they actually did real study, and they actually learned the language. These people aren't interested in really understanding the word of God and, and real scholarship, or they wouldn't come up with this stupidity of being saved in light of the Greek text over in Revelation 21, 24. What they're interested in is deceiving you because they're of the devil. And what they're interested in is making money off of false Bible versions or all their scholarly works or whatever. Uh, they don't make them like they used to when it comes to scholars, unfortunately. Go to Matthew 28. These are all key doctrines that are, that are in effect here. Just a quick review. The modern versions, including the New King James, have changed it from, from you're saved to you're being saved. They changed it from it's a narrow way to it's a difficult way. They changed it from, well, it's hard for people who trust in their riches to just, well, it's just hard to be saved, period. They changed it from, hey, there's two kinds of people. You either believe or you don't believe. They changed it to, hey, there's two kinds of people. You either believe or you don't obey Jesus, which opens the door to a works-based salvation, especially in light of all the other verses that are doing the same thing. Then they, uh, they downgraded the holy child Jesus to uh, the, the holy servant Jesus. Now, Matthew 28 is commonly known as the Great Commission, verses 18 through 20, right? This is a pretty key passage of Scripture, right? Pretty important, winning souls to Christ, getting people saved. And in the key verse, it says in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So there's your great commission. And then obviously to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Now, another parallel passage of this is Mark chapter 16, verse 15. You don't have to turn there, but it says, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So Jesus at various times, at the very end of his work on this earth, after he's risen from the dead, but before he ascended to the Father, he's constantly exhorting the apostles how they need to evangelize the world. And so he tells them, preach the gospel to every creature. As the Father sent me, so send I you. And he tells them to teach all nations, then baptize them, and then teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Obviously, the first teach there is teaching them the gospel. Because if that's the order, teach them, baptize them, and then teach them everything else, the first thing that's being taught is the gospel. And that's why in Mark 16, 15, he just said, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, the Great Commission is under attack by the modern versions. First of all, in Mark chapter 16, there's a note right in the middle of the text between verses 8 and 9 that says everything after verse 8 is not in the original. So it tells you that basically verses... 9 through 20 are add-ons that are not part of the Gospel of Mark. One time I sat in a Baptist church that was an NIV preaching church in a youth group. I was 16 years old. 
And my teacher in my youth group, when I was 16 years old, got up and he said, hey, nowhere does the Bible tell us to just preach the gospel to everybody, just to get everybody the gospel. It just tells us to make disciples, but it doesn't tell us to just preach to everybody the gospel. That's what he said. So I didn't know the Bible very well when I was 16. I, I was just starting to read it cover to cover, and I, and I hadn't ever even read it one time cover to cover. And so when I was 16, I didn't know the Bible real well, but I knew that was wrong. I knew that was false. And when I heard it, it, it made me upset. It made me angry because I thought, well, of course we're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature. So I didn't know uh, where to find it. But I knew it's, it's at the end of the four gospels is where it's at. So I first went to Matthew. And I'm, 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 I told him, I said, hey, just a minute, I'm going to find it for you. Because he said, the Bible never tells us that. I said, well, let me find it for you. So I'm scrambling. I go to, okay, let's try the first gospel. Matthew 28. And I show him, right, you know, teach all nations, baptize. And he said, no, no, no. It says make disciples of all nations. No, make disciples of all nations. That's discipleship. You know, that's, that's basically taking one person under your wing and you're teaching them everything. You know, you're not just going out and just giving the gospel to 100 people in one day, you know, as a church. You're not going to go to, to, to Sacaton, in Arizona and knock every door in one day, get like 90-some people saved. You're not going to bring a group of 75 people into New Orleans and, and preach the gospel to a couple hundred people and, you know, 100 and whatever of them get saved. No, no, no. You make disciples, man. It's discipleship, bro. It's a small group in your home, you know, with that, whatever. That's what the new churches are pushing. They don't like the old-fashioned go out there and just preach the gospel to everybody like they did in the book of Acts. So what does the, uh, the Great Commission here say in the New King James Version, Matthew 28, 19? You look down at, at the real Bible. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What's it say in the, in the New American Standard? Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now this is, a, this is just a case of just dumb translation. Because the word, here's the thing, you know what disciple means? A disciple is someone who is learning from someone else. So because the Greek word for disciple and the Greek word for teach are similar because obviously a disciple is a person who learns things and a teacher is teaching things. They just say, oh, well, this kind of looks like the word for disciple. The word for teach kind of looks like maybe he's telling us to disciple people. No, he's telling you to teach people. That's what every old Bible got it right. You guys don't understand that just because words look similar in a foreign language, that's not really what they mean. What's it say in the uh, ESV? Go therefore and make disciples. Yeah, it's all, all of them. Just make disciples, make disciples, make disciples, make disciples. So, so this teacher, he said, well, no, 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 it's, it's make disciples. So then I said, okay, well, I'll give you another one then. So I, I'm scrambling. Where's the other one? So I try Mark next. So then I go to Mark 16. Bam, got you now, sucker. <laughs> go ye therefore and go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Bam. And here's what he said. Oh, that's not even in the original. Because verses 9 through 20, right, are a later addition. It's not part of what Mark actually wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. That's what all the notes and all the modern versions are going to tell you. Hey, the oldest manuscripts don't contain this. This has no authority. And the New King James is filled with notes like that. Like in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, where it cuts out the second half of the verse about how Grace and works can't mix. It's either grace or it's works. It can't be both. Romans 11, 6. In the New King James, you go to the footnote. Oh, yeah, this, is, this shouldn't be here. Second half of the verse should be omitted. So then I was flustered. I'm trying to find something in Luke. I'm trying to find something in John. I, you know, I couldn't really. I walked away pretty frustrated. Because, you know, according to this guy, he's saying there's nothing. There's nothing to tell us to just go out and give the gospel to every person. Because in his Bible, it wasn't there. But in our Bible, it is there. Amen. Amen? So these are some pretty big changes, pretty big issues. These are some serious, serious problems in these new versions. Go to 1 John chapter 3. 
1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter number 3. This is another one where they'll, they'll twist this. You see, the Bible makes a distinction between the new man and the old man. And the Apostle Paul talks about how he wants to do what's right and he delights in the law of God after the inward man. On the inside, the new creature wants to do what's right. But then he says he ends up doing the stuff he hates. He ends up doing a lot of bad things and sinning. Well, he says twice in Romans 7 that he said, when I do that, I would not. It's no longer I that do it, but it is sin that dwelleth in me. So what he's saying is it's, it's not the real him. It's not the new Paul. It's the flesh that is sinning. It's the old man. Now, this makes perfect sense because when we go to heaven, when we die one day physically and we go to heaven, we'll never sin again. There's no sin allowed in heaven, right? So we sin on this earth because we're in the flesh and the flesh and the spirit are at war. But when our spirit departs our body and heads for heaven, no, we're never going to sin again at that point. Because it's only the flesh that causes us to sin. It's, it's the old Stephen Anderson. And that's why Paul said, I die daily. You know, the old man has to be mortified. He has to be put to death. So in 1 John chapter 3, and I don't have a time to do a whole sermon on the book of 1 John. But in 1 John chapter 1, he makes it crystal clear in verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Yep. So it's crystal clear that obviously we have sin. In our lives. If we say that we don't, we're a liar. Okay. Verse 8 and verse 10 of chapter 1. But in verse 3, he's talking about the new man, the new creature that's born of God. And he says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. So that's talking about the fact that the new man, the, the new creature, the, the one who is born of God, cannot sin, which is why when we go to heaven and we get rid of the flesh, there will be no more sin. The new versions change this and they turn the Greek on its head because the same Greek word is used over and over again in the same tense to just simply mean people doing things. But they add some stuff here because they want to change the meaning of what's being taught. Read 1 John chapter 3 verse 9 from the ESV. It's hard to even find sometimes the verse numbers, yeah. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of so God. So they've added words that are not in the original, that are not even implied in the original of, well, they don't make a practice of sinning. They don't keep on sinning. Whereas in the King James it said, sinneth not, doesn't sin. Because then we look at it and we understand it in the sense of the one who's born of God, the new man, the new creature, the child of God. And we see it in light of verse 1, which says, okay, we know we have sin because we're in the flesh because the old man is still there. But when you're reading in the ESV, it's like, well, yeah, we all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But if you just make a practice of sinning, then you're not saved. And this is what's being preached in churches all over America. This isn't just a theory. This is what's being preached today. Yeah, yeah. Hey, if you keep on sinning, you're not saved. If you make a practice, I mean, what does that even mean to make a practice of sin? Is that like a doctor practice or a dental practice? Does that mean you, you set up some shop of sinning and put a sign on the door? Hey, this is my sinning practice. <laughs> what does that mean to make a practice of sinning? So what? I, well, you might slip up every once in a while, but you better be flying right, buddy. And if you practice, if you sin the same sin, like at a pattern, I mean, that's work salvation, folks. Okay. Did we do, did we check the new King James? Let's check the new King James. First John 3, 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Okay. So the new King James has got that one right. Let's go to first John 5. 18, this is a similar verse, pretty much the same thing as what we saw over in uh, 1 John 3, 9, 1 John 5, 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Let's get this from the ESV. 
We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. So again, it's changed to he doesn't keep on sinning. Keep on sinning. You know, making a practice of sinning. And again, bad translation. It just sounds dumb. He doesn't practice sin. He doesn't make a practice of sinning. There's a lot of examples of just weird language. Like, for example, it'll talk about practicing lawlessness. The King James Bible talks about working iniquity. Sounds like a, uh, it sounds like a good translation. You know, working iniquity. Sounds great. Practice lawlessness. You who make a practice of lawlessness. Okay, the, the King James Bible calls the Antichrist the man of sin. They call it the man of lawlessness. I'm sure now they make it the person of lawlessness. So because they don't want to assume the Antichrist gender. Yeah. <laughs> the person of lawlessness, oh human one. He wants you to make a practice of sinning. It sounds like garbage. Did, did the New King James get it right in that one too? How about the NASB? Well, verse uh, 18. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. Okay, have, I, I've been neglecting you over here. Have you got first, I forgot about you with the NIV. If you got first John 3, 9 for us in the NIV, what do, they, what do they do here? No one who is born of God will continue in sin, continue to sin, because God's seed remains in him. He cannot so, go on sinning. So it says in the NIV, continue to sin, go on sinning. What does that mean? I mean... Look, you're either sinning or you're not. They make it seem like, well, you, you, you're going to sin a little bit, but when you reach a certain threshold where you're just continuing to sin, well, okay, they're sinning, and then there's making a practice of sinning. That's what they're trying. And look, this kind of teaching goes on every day, every week, in churches all over America. Look, how can you be doctrinally sound if that's what you're reading every day? Hey, it's hard to be saved, you're being saved, you're not obeying, you know, you're practicing lawlessness, you're, you're continuing in sin, you're going on sinning, you keep on sinning. And then you wonder where these doctrines come from of works-based salvation. I'll tell you exactly where they're coming from. And look, we could go on all night. I'm done preaching tonight. But I, we, today I kind of focused on salvation-oriented stuff, soul-winning-oriented stuff. But we could, we could do the same thing with hell and show you where the NIV removes every mention of hell in the Old Testament. So if you start reading the NIV in Genesis, you don't get to the word hell until you get to Matthew chapter 5. So what, did hell not exist back then? Was hell an invention of Jesus? No, the King James Bible used the word hell over and over and over again in the Old Testament. But you get this weird, and then you'll have people say, oh, the Jews don't even believe in hell. Hell's not even in the Old Testament, and that's what they say. That's what these rabbis say. That's what these Judaizing Christians say. And then pretty soon, you know, hell is just a parable. Hell's just figurative. That's why it's never even mentioned in the Old Testament. But the King James Bible mentions it in the Old Testament. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I believe it's approximately 20-some 20, 20 times. You know, it's, it's mentioned about the same amount in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. Just a few more times in the Old Testament because obviously the Old Testament's a little bit longer. So we could have picked another subject tonight. We could have picked the deity of Christ. We could have picked hell. We could have picked, you know, uh, uh, even marriage, even just the relationship between men and women, marriage. I mean, the, 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 the new versions will turn that on its head. Even marriage, even child rearing. All the, and look, the point of the sermon is there are two problems in the modern versions. Problem number one, wrong text. But get, here's the thing about that. That's only in the New Testament. Because the Old Testament Hebrew text, there really is only one Hebrew text. Except the new versions, you know what they do? They don't even translate from the Hebrew. Sometimes they'll go with the Septuagint, quote unquote, fake Septuagint. They'll go to the Greek for the Old Testament. Even though the Old Testament's from Hebrew. But the New King James is 99.9% is, uh, .9 from the correct Hebrew in the Old Testament. But every time the NIV changes stuff, it's right there with them changing it. 
So there's two problems with the modern versions. There's the problem of a bad Greek manuscript in the New Testament and a bad Greek manuscript in the Old Testament. Why they're going to Greek for the Old Testament is boggles the mind. But the second problem is just bad translation. Bad translation. And some people say, oh, it's because they weren't literal enough or they, they used too much dynamic equivalence. You're giving them too much credit when you say that. Yeah. Oh, they chose a different translation method, dynamic. No, 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 they didn't. They chose stupid translation method. They chose we don't speak the language transmission, translation method. They chose never been to Greece translation method. <laughs> never eaten tzatziki translation <laughs> method. They've chosen a method of poor work, poor scholars. It's just like any job. Look, if you're an electrician, you've seen electricians who do bad work, who do crummy work. Have you seen it? Yeah. If you're a carpenter, you've seen crummy work. You've seen crummy plumbing, crummy landscaping, crummy tree trimming. You've seen people who take pride in their work and they do a good job and they're experts and they, they do well and they put effort into it. And then you've seen people who just do the minimum. And they do just junky work. And I don't care if we're talking about graphic design, computer programming. Uh, just There's sloppiness in all areas, right? Yeah. Just, just doing a bad job. Just you're bad at your job. Just you didn't study. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. You're not a professional. That's what's going on with these modern versions. A bunch of lame people. And look, they had a lesbian on the NIV to, for the style. And here's what they say. Well, she didn't do any, she didn't do any translation. When you tell them about Dr. Virginia Mollencott, yeah. the open lesbian on the NIV translation committee, oh, don't worry, she didn't do any translation. She was just on the style committee. Oh, what a relief. So it's in some dyke style. <laughs> That's the worst place to put her. Put her on Leviticus 2013. <laughs> and then make a practice of it. But, you know, but they sit there and, and oh, she just, she just did the style. No wonder it sounds so queer in so many places. Yeah. You got somebody on the style committee who doesn't even know the difference between a boy and a girl. No wonder they can't translate effectively. And then there was a guy involved with the New American Standard who was a male homosexual. And, you know, there, there's all kinds of skeletons in that closet, friend. We need to stick with the King James Bible. And, and, and don't let people, oh, you're one of those King James. Yeah, call us crazy that we actually think that these books that say dramatically different things are not the same as what we grew up with, what we got saved with, what's been preached for hundreds and hundreds of years in the English-speaking world. It call us crazy for sticking with the Bible that for the last 400 years has been the standard and replaced all others. Look, do you realize that when the King James Bible came out and once it started getting circulated and people started reading it, all the other Bibles went out of print? You say, well, what about the Geneva Bible? Look, people are bringing back the Geneva Bible now, but that thing was out of print for a long time yeah. because everybody was on the King James. The King James was the standard for 400 years. Call us crazy if we're not ready to go turn in our King James for these pieces of junk. And no, they don't say the same thing. No, they're not easier to understand. No, they, well, all the doctrine's the same. No, it isn't. It messes with all doctrines. And tonight I just focused on the most important doctrine, which is salvation. Pick your doctrine. It's messed up in those versions. There has to be a reason why these fun centers don't believe anything we believe. Why don't they? Because they don't even have the same Bible. I mean, that's, the, look, the Jehovah's Witnesses had to make their own Bible because they don't believe in biblical Christianity. So they have to make up their own Bible. We need to stick with the King James Version and, and don't be apologetic. Just, hey, it's King James only. Amen. No apology. And, and listen, if there's a church that's using another version, I wouldn't go there. That's a deal breaker for me. Because it's gonna, they're going to go down a lot of wrong paths because that thing's going to lead them astray over and over and over again. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that in the English-speaking world, we've been given 
uh, an accurate translation of the Bible, the King James Bible. It's been tried, tested for 400 years. The only people who say that it's wrong are people who are bad at their job and, and, and they, they, they can't even understand verb tenses in a foreign language because they've, they've only fluently spoken English their whole life. They've never even gotten fluent in another language to even get good at it, Lord. I, I just pray that, Lord, we wouldn't be deceived by these, these, uh, these counterfeits, Lord. They're destroying America. They're destroying our churches with these, these uh, watered-down versions they take out hell. They turn the two-edged sword into a butter knife that's soft and, and, and politically correct, Lord. Give us the hard-edged, razor-sharp King James Version of the Bible, Lord, and let us cling to it until we die, Lord. And help us not to just enshrine it, but to use it every single day. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, let's go ahead and sing one more song, song number 155. Song number 155, doxology, song number 155. I mean, look, even if, even if the doctrine was all the same, which it's clearly not, even if the doctrine was all the same, if it sounds poor, how can, you, you're not going to want to take it door to door preaching it to people if it sounds weird, if it sounds lame. I mean, look, you can feel good about pulling out a King James Bible and quoting those verses, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, you know, why? It's just like power, 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 bam. People receive Christ as Savior when they hear that stuff because it's got power in it. It's God's word. You go around with the NIV, people look at you like you're a dork and a dweeb. And that's why these people, that's why they don't have soul winning. Yeah. They're like, oh, we tried it once and everybody thought we were a dweeb. You are a dweeb. Amen. And your Bible's a dweeb version. <laughs> it's dweeby. And they, 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 they hear that stuff and they're like, what in the world? I don't believe in that book. You know, it sounds, I mean, look, whenever I hear stuff from the Book of Mormon, I'm like, that sounds, do, that sounds doofus. And when I hear stuff from the Quran, you know, you'll have, if you have Muslim friends or, you know, they'll, they'll post something from the Quran on Facebook. You're like, what? It sounds lame. But when, it, when you see those King James Bible verses on your Facebook feed, you always click like on those because there's power there. You're like, oh, yeah, I love that. Yeah. That's how I feel. You say, oh, you know, are you the judge? No, no, the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. And whenever I see the King James Version or hear the King James Bible, God speaks to me Amen. through those words. The NIV, you're kind of like, is it, it, you know what? You know what the NIV is like? It's, I'm, I'm just going to continue to preach. No, I'm just kidding. You know what the NIV is like? The NIV is like when you open up an instruction manual and you're like, whoever wrote this didn't speak English. Because it's a bad translation. You know what I'm talking about? You're like, oh man, this is a this is a bad translation. Whoever wrote this was not an American. That's how you feel when you read the NIV. All right, song number 155. Let's sing it out down at the bottom of the page there. 155. 